recording. Here we go. Perfect. Thank you. All right, attendees, uh, attendees, just a quick reminder. Uh, you are very welcome to interact with us in the chat or the Q&A panels. Um, you also have a poll that has been activated that you can answer to let us know who you are. And uh, our host will stop the poll uh, when we start the presentation. We are so joining today uh, for a conversation about Mars. And uh, I would like to shortly introduce the speakers before we start. So we are joined today by Roberto Rossei, who is currently um, uh, staffed as senior researcher at the Instituto di Radio Astronomia in Bologna. He has worked in uh, uh, other institutes and he has a master's in astrophysics and a PhD in engineering. Uh, first contributing both to the design and operation of remote sensing experiments aboard space missions uh, and to the analysis of scientific interpretation of their data. And we also have with us Akos Keresturi, uh, who is a planetary scientist um, at the Research Center for Astronomy and Earth Science in Budapest in Hungary, and um, also at the European Astrobiology Institute in, in Strasbourg in France. His expertise is in solid uh, surface planetary science, including geomorphology, mineralogy, petrology, as well as laboratory analysis of meteorites and analog materials. He is doing field work at Mars Analog Terrains, and I'm sure we will be uh, hearing about that. And he's working on astrobiology aspects and planetary missions design also. Um, Roberto and Akos, we are very lucky to have you with us today. Thank you very much for joining. Um, attendees, before we start, I would like to remind you that this is a one hour total time presentation. Uh, we will have in that meantime, a presentation from the speakers and then we will have a time for Q&A with them. If you want to ask a question, you can ask it in the chat, but I would recommend to use the Q&A panel to track all the questions more easily. Um, if you have a question you want to ask by talking, you can ask us to unmute yourself and we'll do our best to do so. Um, so uh, now that I have introduced everyone, I think we're ready to go. So Roberto and Akosh, the floor is yours. Don't forget to unmute, please, you're, you're on mute. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for the introduction and for the invitation. So um, the title, what is the below the surface of Mars, alludes to uh, what, why, uh, and why we care about uh, what is below the surface of Mars. And this, of course, has to do with the main reason for which uh, all space agencies in the world are interested in Mars, so the search of life outside the Earth. This is the ultimate goal. Um, but to get there, we need to understand what happened to Mars and why we think that Mars can be a place where life could have developed and perhaps, very much perhaps, could be existing today. So let me introduce this uh, subject briefly with a more historical perspective and um, just very quickly. And um, the, if you, uh, well, if you look at Mars today, uh, this is a picture taken by one of the rovers, Curiosity in particular, specifically. And uh, you would look at a planet that uh, superficially uh, resembles Earth, in the sense that a uh, landscape like this could be also found on Earth in the deserts of, of our planet, but in whose atmosphere is so thin that a lot of the vast majority of ultraviolet radiation and charged particles coming from cosmos uh, reach the surface without being absorbed by the atmosphere like it happens on Earth. And thus means um, that our, the surface of Mars is very hostile to life. It's very, uh, any, any uh, living organism that could conceivably survive at the surface of Mars would be quickly killed by ultraviolet radiation, at least the organisms we know of. Also, not to mention the fact that the atmosphere is very thin, 
it's only less than 1% of the, of the density of the atmosphere on Earth and is made of carbon dioxide, which is not particularly amenable for, for uh, organisms like us. And uh, also temperature is almost invariably below zero. So it's not that, <laughs> it's a very hostile environment for life. In fact, it's not very favorable. However, the obsession or at least the interest or uh, the concept that Mars could have life started, well, of course, started a long time ago. And uh, it became also ingrained in our culture so that we somehow imagine that any a uh, visitor from space could be conceivably coming from Mars. And the reason for that is historically, the fact that the early maps of Mars that were produced by the Italian astronomer, Virginio Schiaparelli in the last quarter of the 19th century, contained uh, features that he named uh, as can uh, canali in Italian, uh, which were translated in English as canals, which mean artificial canals. Now, what Schiaparelli was seeing were, in fact, aberrations of his telescope and uh, subject also to the psychological tendency of the human brain to connect dots and form lines and patterns. But in the case of the British, uh, the translation in English of his work, uh, the choice of the wrong term sparked the idea that Schiaparelli was thinking that Mars was inhabited and that uh, there was a civilization producing uh, artificial canals. And there comes then the idea of life, intelligent life, and aliens coming from outer space. Now, Schiaparelli got everything wrong in this respect. However, I just like to mention the fact but in spite of that, his maps are the basis for the names of uh, geologic features on Mars today. So this is a fun fact that although he did not get, it, get anything right in terms of what was going on on Mars, what the surface of Mars was like, his, map, his maps remain the reference for the naming of features on the surface of Mars nowadays. Anyway, when finally Mars was visited by the first spacecraft in 1965 with a flyby by the Mariner 4 NASA spacecraft. The first picture it took uh, taken by, of the surface of Mars were, well, this quality, which is not very high, and they showed the landscape dotted by craters like that of the moon. So that was the final nail on the coffin of the idea that Mars was a civilized planet with an intelligent civilization uh, dominating its surface. And also, it was the end of a lot of speculations about uh, the possible habitability of Mars, because that really looks like an environment like that of the moon that was completely barren and devoid of life. However, once that uh, better pictures and more accurate coverage, more complete coverage of the surface could be achieved already in 1971 by Mariner 9, strange features start to appear in the pictures, and they were reminiscent of a different geologic history, not like the moon, the, the, the barren desert in which nothing ever happened, and there were only craters formed by, by meteorites from the outside. And so, starting from this, the interest on Mars, in Mars, in Mars exploration and its potential habitability, especially because of the picture on the left that looks like a river, although a very strange one, admittedly, was renewed. And so uh, from here, uh, the study of the surface and the history and geology uh, became one of the focal points of uh, space exploration. And with, after this brief introduction, I leave the floor to Akush to explain what actually was found on the surface of Mars and what we know about the history and geology of the planet. Thank you very much. Hello, everybody. So as Roberto said, we have several missions already, for it has flown to Mars and landed partly and will be there in the near future. So we can have a much better picture. Here we take a, a, a closer look at the Martian surface. What we can see if we look from far away to the planet, we can see, first of all, many impact craters. At the top right, you can see, for example, a nice basin. <coughs> And the bottom right, you can see a color elevation map of the surface of Mars, which shows there are really many impact craters and the southern hemisphere down. 
uh, below or down lower part of the image. So the lower part is very old, but also there are locations on the Martian surface which are much younger. For example, in the northern, uh, using this simple map-based approach. What, can, what else can we find? We can find, for example, large volcanoes, which are not active anymore. They are pretty old, but there are several large volcanic uh, centers on Mars. The largest is the Tarsis uh, <clears throat> volcanoes the, at the Tarsis bulge, but you can see at left, a small peaking up uh, white dots at the left part of, the, of this map. And even, left, even toward the left, you can see a three-dimensional view of two volcanic cones. So there are several volcanoes on Mars, but, are, but they are not active. However, recently, <clears throat> 100 million years ago, a few of them were active. And we also do not find continental plates like on the Earth. So we can see Mars is more like a static planet compared to the Earth. There are, there are not continents, not moving parts, and not currently active volcanic eruptions. Please go to the next slide. We can take a closer look on the <clears throat> surface. You can see at the top right, a comparison between Earth and Mars. Actually, the tilt of the rotational axis is pretty much the same, which is a coincidence, nothing more, but it shows there is a seasonal change on the surface of Mars. And at left, you can see these change on a simplified uh, diagram where you can see sun in the center, a bit left from the center, and then Mars orbits around the sun. And there are two reasons why seasons are changing. First is the tilt of the rotational axis, similar as on the Earth, but the distance of, this, of Mars from the sun also changes. So it makes somewhat asymmetric seasons between the two hemispheres, and it produces a lot of uh, seasonal annual changes. If you look at the surface, you can see a <clears throat> familiar image in the right. You can see this reddish, brownish, yellowish uh, something, which is, an, uh, which is composed of oxidized dust. So it is oxidized high oxides, hydroxides, and like this, oxidized rusty things actually. <laughs> and if you take a look at the middle of the image, you can see two curves. These are daily temperature curves. At the top, with the blue color, you can see the annual temperature curve, I mean, the daily temperature curve on the Earth. It is a, if most of the visitors of the attendees are from the Northern hemisphere of this, of this talk, then they might, witness the same temperature regime roughly, for example, in Europe or North America. In the morning, it is close to zero, a bit above, but daytime it reaches not 20, but close to that. So this is an average day out in the autumn on the earth. Below that, you can see the diagram, as you can see a curve with red color. It is from Mars. So this is a typical daily Uh, we lost in the same day. Oh. <laughs> Can you hear me now? Yes. 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 Okay. So, so I hope. Uh, yeah, I can hear. Yes. Okay. So once again, uh, in the middle, in the middle bot, in the middle diagram at the bottom, you can see the red curve, which shows the daily temperature. One hundred Celsius of fluctuation a day. It would be very difficult to dress on Mars because the temperature is very high in daytime compared to the nighttime. Okay, let's move forward to the next slide. <clears throat> yes, so this is a... Akos, you're, many you're eyes. cutting again. Can you, can you start again for this slide? Okay, uh, so... This slide shows many, many isolated features on the surface of Mars. At the bottom right, you can see three images of Mars. The first is the is a summertime from the northern hemisphere. Then we are going through autumn to winter, and you can see the growing size of the seasonal polar cap. So, because of the seasonal changes, the polar cap in the winter hemisphere growing, 
and in the summer hemisphere, it's shrinking. There are many, many ice locations, ice occurrences, not only in the, in the polar region, but also there is a frost condensation on the surface. In the bottom left, you can see an impact crater, which excavates ice or snow-like ice from the subsurface, very shallow. So it looks like not, at, uh, not only at the Martian polar caps, we have ice, but we have mid-latitude features, mid-latitude regions, where if you have covered ice with dust, or we have hiding glacier-like ice in the subsurface. Please go to the next slide. Okay. Yes, and I would like to hand over to Roberto. Thanks. So the fact that Mars had a, let's say, a current present in which you have dead volcanoes, you had dead rivers, but, and you have a cold climate, however, points to the fact that in the past, these things were active. And uh, this has led to the hypothesis that all the features like the, the strange river that was seen before that are not everywhere on Mars, but are in certain areas, especially close to the equator, implied a different climate, a different history for the climate of Mars. So that in the past, uh, somehow the temperature was higher. Now, there's a problem here because uh, Mars is more distant from the sun than the Earth it is 1.4 times more distant, which means, of course, that the solar irradiation, the energy reaching the, uh, the square meter per square meter from the sun is about uh, half that of the Earth. So how do you do that? How do you manage to increase temperature below the freezing point? Well, the answer is probably, uh, of course, this is still an hypothesis, but is uh, rather, well, which is someone which is uh, an hypothesis, which is largely uh, considered plausible, is a uh, greenhouse effect. So the temperature and um, the, at the surface of Mars could have been increasing because the atmosphere of Mars, which is made of CO2, and of course CO2 uh, locks in uh, in the uh, in the under, in the mind of people with uh, climate change and greenhouse effect. Well, this CO2 atmosphere could have been producing a greenhouse effect had it been denser than it is today. So, if Mars had a denser, thicker atmosphere made of CO2 and perhaps methane, methane, which is another powerful greenhouse gas, then temperature at the surface could have been different and water could have been staying uh, so, uh, liquid and carve the surface features like the dried rivers that we see today. What happened then? Well, uh, there were hypotheses about that, but only recently it was possible to measure a, a, a process which is taking place now. Mars is losing its atmosphere. These images have been produced from, uh, thanks to the instruments aboard the MAVEN uh, spacecraft from NASA, and they show essentially how the solar wind, the constant flux of particles that is emitted by the sun, impact the Martian atmosphere and drag part of it away with it. So essentially the theory, the most, uh, let's say, accepted theory on the possible fate of the Martian atmosphere is that it was lost due to uh, the interaction with the solar wind. Why is it so? Well, you can see in fact that uh, the um, ions coming from the sun uh, tend to uh, interact very heavily with the surface and, well, before the surface with the atmosphere, and they somehow, uh, both electrically and also uh, mechanically, simply by kicking uh, molecules in the atmosphere, tend to take away uh, the gas of the atmosphere from the planet. And uh, the big difference between Mars and the Earth, the reason why this is has not hap happened on Earth so massively is that Earth has a magnetic field contrarily to Mars. Mars does show remnants of an ancient magnetic field that remained frozen in the oldest part of its crust. But that was probably gone billions of years ago. Whereas on Earth, the magnetic field, the dipolar magnetic field extending from the pole to pole is essentially a screen 
that deflects the solar wind away from the atmosphere and prevents the dragging and the erosion of our atmosphere by the solar wind. Mars was not so lucky, apparently. So what we think it happened is that Mars had a magnetic field in the past. This magnetic field somehow stopped uh, uh, the, the dynamo, uh, which still exists on Earth today, uh, ended early on Mars. And that left its atmosphere exposed to the solar wind. And the solar wind dragged it away. So uh, another factor contributing to the loss of the atmosphere is the fact that volcanic activity, as it was mentioned by Akos, ended early on Mars. And uh, this is, let's say, something that had a greater, much greater importance in the past, also in the production of water and so on. But the details are again left to Akos. And so fire and ice is what happened to the volcanoes and the water on the surface of Mars. Akos, you appear to be in these early days, or what has been left after these early days? I'm sorry. Uh, I'm hearing someone speaking. I, but... I'm sorry. I hope. I hope so. Akos, I think you're frozen again. Hmm. I see you. It's not frozen. Yes, I mean, we can see you now. We can hear you now. Okay, sorry. There is something in the air, maybe. I don't know how. So let's take a closer. When the atmosphere was thicker, the air and warmer and wet. Oh, okay, no? you are you are still um, you are still frozen, and we cannot hear everything you are saying. Maybe oh, we can sorry. try with the video to see if uh, we get a better connection with you. Mm, no. Let's try with the video. Can you try to, to talk? Uh, hello. Yes. Can you hear me now? Yes. yes. OK. Yes. <clears throat> so with invisible, is much better. OK. So let's take a closer look on this early period. So we can see many volcanoes on Mars. And using crater statistics, we can estimate when were they active. And most of the activity is from this very early period, let me say one, let me say one billion years. So Mars also formed about uh, four and a half billion years like the Earth. And for about one billion years, it was volcanically very active. What means <clears throat> this volcanic activity together with the ice that was also probably there produced a lot of liquid water. The consequence, so ice was melting and gas was exhalated to the atmosphere, which also supported this greenhouse effect that Roberto said. And altogether, it made a bit warmer, but much more wetter planet than it is today. We can see several examples in the, uh, at the bottom, left and in the middle, that shows not only very early rivers were there, but also after the, the planet began to cool down, there was still some activity related to liquid water because of the ice was melted by this volcanic uh, activity and produced large outflows, so-called outflow channels, which ephemerally produced uh, large lakes or even seas, which did not last very long. But sometimes this liquid water appeared again on the surface. Please go to the next slide. OK. so. What we see if we evaluate, evaluating very old fluvial features, we can see from the very early period fluvial channels. At right, you can see a very nice crater lake basin where surrounding channels emptied their water to this uh, crater lake very early. And we also had probably a global ocean, what is visible at the left, probably at the very early period 
And sometimes later, during these outflows, a part of this ocean was filled by water for a given period. But as the time passed by, we, we had a colder and colder planet with a global cryosphere was formed, which means there was uh, water ice frozen into the porosity and fractures of the rocks, which covered the whole planet as a, with a permafrost-like solid surface or shallow subsurface layer. Please go to the next slide. <coughs> yes. Hey. Now, we have seen that Mars was very different in the past, and uh, I thought this is still being a point of debate. Uh, we have a general idea of how long this lasted, as uh, Akos mentioned, the longest period we expect that uh, for, for volcanic activity to be uh, important on Mars is about 1 billion years. Now, this scheme, this, uh, this uh, image picture shows a general scheme of what was happening on Mars in the different geologic ages. Now, I, uh, there's not the time to enter so much into detail, but in general, the history, geologic history of Mars is divided into three main eras, Neo-Okean, Neo, uh, okay, sorry, uh, Noachian, sorry, <laughs> Hesperian and Amazonian. And uh, the magnetic field was probably lost in the very early days. The big impact uh, basins were formed also in the early days. Volcanism died away slowly over maybe a billion or more years. Surface chemistry also was changes as we find uh, elements, minerals that are formed by the action of water in the oldest terrain. And then we find uh, minerals formed by the action of ice in the inter intermediate age terrain. And then we find minerals that have never met water in any form in the more recent landforms. And um, we also know that water was present in the past as a was mentioned before, but then it became rarer and rarer. But if we compare the time evolution of the geology of Mars with that of the Earth, we find that the early stages of the Martian geology where water was present and abundant on the Earth surface coincide with the period in which life developed on Earth. So even if it was very, very early on, uh, we find that by the time in which life existed on the surface of Mars, uh, oh, sorry, on the surface of the Earth, Freudian, um, Mars was similar or had a wet uh, water, uh, liquid water on the surface and could conceivably have had similar conditions to those of the Earth that led to the development of life. So the big question here is, okay, this is very complicated, but I leave it for reference, is to, figure out what could be the conditions in the early Mars and if they were compatible with life. Because the time that Mars was similar to the Earth is in principle for, for what we know sufficient for life to develop because it did develop on Earth in the, about the same time. So for life to exist in general, we have criteria which we label habitability and in a more general terms, they require the presence of certain chemical elements that in specifically are carbon, hydrogen, nitrogen, oxygen, phosphorus, and so forth. And they require a source of energy, they require liquid water, and also physical conditions that are, let's say, appropriate, like uh, no radioactivity or no strong ultraviolet radiation, et cetera, et cetera. All these conditions were present on Mars. So, what happened, we do not know, because in general, we do not know how life arose on Earth. We still do not know how to produce a simplest living organism in the lab. We, uh, there are the the exp uh, exploration of the uh, birth of life from non-life is still, uh, contains still many mysteries. So we are not sure. If Mars, first of all, was inevitable in the past, we think so, but that's not for granted. And we do not know if, when, even if, if it was inevitable, if it ever developed life, because we do not know exactly what it takes for life to develop. Is it a rare event that requires some special uh, random circumstances that happens only once every 20 planets or so? 
this is also the reason why we are so interested in looking for life on Mars. If we ever, we ever were to find evidence of life, even the dead life, past life on Mars, that would mean, that would imply that life tends to develop rather commonly in the universe once the conditions are met. Of course, this is something we do not know for sure now, and it would be very important to know, to understand also what is the fate of life in the universe, Will the universe be inhabited by life throughout its history, or is life some rare occurrence that has no meaning, no, let's say, essentially no impact on the general evolution of the universe? Anyway, uh, even if life was present in the, in the past of Mars, the problem is it cannot exist on Mars today, at least at the surface. So we know that life uh, had to find another place where to survive, as Mars changed over the billions of years. And we know also that there is water on the surface of Mars, as Akos mentioned, but it's in the form of ice. So where can we find liquid water? We know that Mars is a planet similar to Earth, and so it has at, at least partly molten core. And this means that it's hotter in the interior than in the surface. And this means also that there is a temperature gradient that uh, when you go down, like it happens on Earth, temperature increases. On Earth, on average, temperature in the crust increases by three degrees Celsius every 100 meter depth increase. So eventually, even if we know that probably, we do not know exactly how fast temperature increases in the, in the, in the Martian subsurface, we know that at a certain point, we will reach the temperature at which ice melts and liquid water can exist but it will be deep down in the subsurface. So we can imagine that there is somewhere in the subsurface of Mars, a place where liquid water exists, maybe more than in one place. And then that's the place, even if it's far away from us, very distant and very difficult to reach, down deep in the subsurface, a place where life could conceivably exist. Because even on Earth, there are bacteria that survive in the subsurface and they, sustain themselves by oxidizing iron, for example, and certainly iron oxide, as was mentioned by Akos, are very abundant on the Martian surface in the Martian crust. So the search for liquid water became the important, the most important theme for Mars exploration in the past. And uh, it's, it's the reason why many agencies, space agencies, starting from NASA, started developing ways, experiments to find water on Mars. Now, the way that was attempted, one of the ways was the, through the use of radars. And these radars, for example, are used on Earth to probe the ice glaciers in, in, uh, in, in Antarctica or in Greenland and uh, detect water below. That's, in fact, the way in which many subglacial lakes, tens of them, were detected below Antarctica. Um, starting well, initially uh, it was difficult because nobody expected them to be there, but once it was found that they actually existed, the use of radio waves that are capable of penetrating into the ice for kilometers and then reflect uh, very brightly when they meet water uh, became the standard method for finding more lakes. So it's the dielectric properties, the way in which the material, the ice and water, react to an electromagnetic pulse that make this technique possible. On Mars, you have very frozen, very cold temperature uh, at the surface. And this means that the materials that are, and because materials that are very cold are also very transparent to radio waves, this makes Mars an ideal place where a radar similar to the ones that are used in, uh, on Earth to detect subglacial water, subglacial lakes can be used. Now, similar experiments were run, well, the first one was run on the Apollo 17, and then there was nothing for 20 years, but eventually, um, sorry, more than 30 years almost, and uh, eventually, however, one of similar of these radars was put on the European Space Agency Mars Express spacecraft. Its name is Marsis, and it's still operating today. Now, Marsis is capable of probing through the subsurface, down to depths of 3.7 kilometers. And this is a radar section, the black and white image you see here, showing the bottom of the southern polar cap of Mars. 
Now, the problem is that it's not easy to identify water on Mars from radar data alone. On Earth, it's still possible to drill a hole and go and watch for yourself. But on Mars, you have to rely on uh, very, very, uh, let's say, uh, sparse evidence. You have essentially the radar signal and perhaps some other um, geological settings that can help you identify water. And also, radar is difficult to operate at Mars. And essentially, for many years, we were forced to operate it at below its full capability because of limitations in the quantity of data we could transmit from Mars. But eventually, this limitation was overcome. And so from data that looked like this, we finally could obtain data that looked like this, provided us with much more resolution and detail and the light blue spots you see in this radar section highlight the areas where reflections from the bottom of the polar cap are so bright, radar echoes are so bright that they are stronger from the, than the echoes coming from the surface. And that was the basic evidence that led to the conclusion that liquid water was still present on Mars today and could be seen in radar images. So, Thanks to a lengthy uh, analysis that lasted years, and I will not discuss here because of the lack of time, we eventually mapped an area uh, which is here highlighted in blue and is uh, shown as an inset in the right part of the image close to the pole, the South Polar Cap, okay, within the South Polar Cap and close to the South Pole, more correctly, where the reflections were so bright they were interpreted as due to the presence of water. So now we know that there is liquid water on Mars, and we know that then, if possible, but we do not know that the exact details of the conditions there. However, now that we know that this possibility exists, of course, we know also that we have to change our approach to the exploration of Mars. Um, eventually, this leads to current plans for explorations that will be explained by Akos in a minute. Uh, and then also to a future which we still cannot foresee because we do not have the technology, but in which hopefully one day someone will go and look beneath the South Polar Cap to see if really we were right and there's liquid water there. Okay, I leave the floor again for to Akash for the conclusions. And yes, please go ahead. Yes, thank you. So there is a certain chance what we have seen for the emergence of life. And uh, let's take a closer look how can we find the answer? Is there really, uh, did it really happen or not? So in the next, next steps regarding the Mars exploration in the next, let me say one or two decades, we have the following main aims. The first is a sample return. We need Martian samples targeted, collected targetedly from the surface and return to the earth, which is very difficult because Something to take back from Mars to Earth in a container is not easy, but it's still going on. I mean, the preparation and the first test. The next thing is do, to do drilling. Actually, we need to drill. As we already mentioned earlier, the surface of Mars is bombarded with ultraviolet radiation. Everything is oxidized. There is a particle radiation also. So we need to drill at least one meter below the surface, which is absolutely not easy, especially on another planet, but can be done. For example, in the middle, you, be, you can see a, an, a, an, an image, a hypothetical image of a driller on board a rover, probably from the ExoMars plan, which would be able to drill down to two meter depths below the surface and acquire a sample from these depths. Okay, it's quite useful. And for example, analyze it there or take back to the earth again. The third important thing is, is the drone usage. Uh, based on NASA Ingenuity drone, we can see there is a possibility to fly above the surface of Mars, which is very interesting. Unfortunately, the mass is very small that can be carried on. But if we, were, if we are able to develop, for example, a one or two kilogram mass ground penetrating radar, which is actually partly happening during this fly radar project, where you can see the logo at the, at the bottom, it would be possible to send such a drone on the surface of Mars, which would be able to fly several 10 kilometers and map the subsurface distribution of ice or even find liquid water there. 
Another thing is the in-situ research utilization uh, marked with acronym ISRU in the line before the last, which uh, shows if we want to go there by human, it should be useful to not to carry everything from the earth, but use the resources already being there. For example, dig into the subsurface and excavate this ice and analyze, and not only analyze, but use it for liquid water, for oxygen, and also as oxygen and hydrogen separated as a rock fuel. And finally, we need to go there by human to see actually how can we put together this complex image. Please go to the next slide. Yes, okay, so what can we do? What we need to do? We need to search for ancient biosignatures, what requires preservation to have it a good, good shape that, that given biosignature. We need subsurface access. Regarding the current possibilities for liquid water, as uh, Roberto mentioned, subsurface heated locations can be interesting partly at the volcanoes, partly at other locations. The problem, they are very, very deep in the subsurface. So it's not an easy job to acquire some sample from there. And there is, there is still another possibility is the surface or shallow subsurface liquids where we do not need to search for regular bulk water as we have, for example, in our, in our glass in the earth, in our room, but maybe some special form of liquid brine, which means a salty solution. At the right, you can see the, uh, the phase diagram of the liquid water. The liquid phase you, have, you can have at the top left corner and the red horizontal bar marks the current surface conditions on Mars. But if you put some melting point decreasing salts into the system, you can have much lower temperature liquid water. So there is a possibility that because of the salts, we can have much more lower temperature liquid water in the, in the subsurface of Mars, but can be identified. And finally, somehow can be reached or need to be reached and, and uh, sampled to have a final answer. Was there really, are there really some signatures of early life or even a current life in, in the subsurface of Mars or not? So we need to do some, some excess into the subsurface. And maybe this is the last slide, I'm not sure. Let's take forward. Yeah, this is the last slide. <laughs> okay. Thank you okay. very much. Thank you, Roberto. Thank you, Akash. Uh, this was a, a fantastic talk. Thank you for sharing both your visions of, uh, of Mars exploration. Yes, so this slide is uh, from us, Lectures Without Borders. Uh, this is for you attendees. If you want to send us some feedback and tell us what you thought, you can use that QR code or go to our website. Um, all right, we do have time for questions. So uh, I will, I will um, ask the attendees, if you want to ask questions, please use the Q&A panel and send us your questions. Uh, since we have talked about uh, the liquid water on Mars, uh, at the end of that talk, I see that we have a question from Anita in the in the Q and A panel, and they are asking: Is there any evidence of liquid water below the surface of other planets in the solar system? So, um, who wants to go? <laughs> Akash, um, I can I can handle this if you if you are okay with that. Um, so, yeah, Roberto, you can see the question. Okay, okay. Can okay. Um, uh, yes, of course. Sorry. Yes, yes. Please do. <laughs> yes. Um, thanks. The the answer is yes, and surprisingly, uh, much farther away from the sun than than Mars, and in particular, there are um, the moons of the of Jupiter, uh, Europa, and perhaps Ganymede and Callisto, which uh, have evidence of liquid water in an ocean of liquid water under the surface. The surface is made of water ice. It's a big thick crust of water ice that can probably be at least kilometers and maybe tens of kilometers thick. But these moons are so close to their big planet, Jupiter, which is so huge, that the tides that Jupiter causes on those moons are sufficient to crack the ice and to squeeze it back and forth 
to the extent that it melts. So apparently, the tidal energy of Mars of, of Jupiter, I'm sorry, uh, is sufficient to uh, explain why there could be liquid water. And there are uh, there is signs there are signs of the presence of liquid water in even um, very very solid evidence because, for example, on Europa. Um, a geyser, a, a spray of water coming from the interior was actually photographed, imaged by, by the Hubble Space Telescope. So, and, and that's the reason why um, future missions to the outer solar systems will stop there to take a look. In particular, in the coming few years, both the US and the European missions should be sent to the system, uh, to, to, to Jupiter's moons. And, uh, and they both carry radars similar to Mars's to look beneath the surface. But that's not the end of it. There's also um, uh, the uh, Enceladus, one of the moons of Saturn that is twice as distant from the sun as Jupiter, in which probably for the same reason, for tidal forces and resonance, orbital resonances, uh, the, there is liquid, there's, there is evidence of liquid water. Again, here, the Cassini spacecraft orbiting around Saturn was able to catch an image of geysers explaining, or let's say, uh, spraying water into, into space. So, uh, and that's even more interesting because uh, if you fly by such one of such geysers, you can actually collect material from the interior, from the ocean of Enceladus and analyze and look for chemicals that are indicative of the presence of, of, of liquid water, oh, sorry, of life. Excellent. Akos, do you want to add something to this answer? Mm, I can add, I can absolutely uh, agree with all of these. So okay. there is an important, uh, important, actually, if you, if you look surface or shallow subsurface water beyond the Earth, Mars is the best solution. We have these, these subsurface, deep subsurface IC satellite hosting liquid water, but the next step that is very close, the closest to Earth, both in distance and both in, in type of occurrence is Mars. Thank you. Um, I see that we have a question in the chat regarding more your scientific career, but I would like to stay on, on the science part for now because I have a question for you. Regarding uh, what you both mentioned about the surface of Mars, you talked about uh, old surface, young surface, and uh, it seemed that you had, saw a relationship between craters and the age of the surface. Maybe this is not uh, something that all the attendees are familiar with. So maybe uh, you could give us a brief explanation on how we actually date a surface. Akosh, do you want to go with this? Uh, thank, thank you. Yes, it's a quite important question, an important topic also. So, if you put anything into the space, into space, and wait for, let me say, four billion years, you can have a growing number of impact craters on the surface. So the density, the spatial density of impact craters, is almost continuously growing, probably mainly at the beginning, but at a slower rate, it is continuously growing, which which gives you a relative dating of a given surface when you count the number of craters at a given area. You need to absolutize this relative age, what happened from the surface of the moon. The Apollo missions and some lunar missions also uh, brought samples to the Earth <clears throat> from the given, from given areas where it was possible to numerically using radioactive isotopes date these given surface units. And if we link the given absolute age to the relative crater density, then you can have a general approach. How can you estimate what is the age of a given surface? Of course, this is only this is mainly the did for the moon, for the moon, but it you can extrapolate to Mars also. It's a bit farther away, a bit larger mass, but so it's a bit complex, but roughly the same chronological system can be used for Mars. Partly because it is probably it probably works well, and partly we do not have much better solution yet. So this is how we can we estimate. Besides this, you can estimate by stratigraphic uh, relation the age of given surface features. Take a look: is that a dune on the top of the volcano, for example, or is that 
uh, old <clears throat> sedimentary deposit covers another crater. So with this approach, you can also uh, you also identify which surface unit is older or which is younger. But for absolute age, the lunar based chronology is, is required. Okay, thank you. It's interesting to see that in your presentation, there is a lot of uh, comparison or at least looking back and forth at other planets too. Like you've, you've shown the Earth and you've shown similar phenomenon on the Earth. Now you're talking about the moon for impact craters. So uh, basically I would, uh, I would uh, dare conclude that there is a, a, um, a kind of a, uh, approach that consists of looking at similar laws of physics and and uh, planetary evolution all across the solar system to understand particular planets which is extremely interesting um, so let's go let's jump to the question that we have uh, regarding your careers um, we we would like to know what were your favorite school subjects when, uh, and when you did decide to become scientists and uh, from that, uh, if you had advice for the young audience that we have, what shall a person uh, be good at to become a good scientist? Roberto, do you want to start? Okay, who wants to, to answer this first? Um, Please do it, don't worry. Okay, okay. Yeah, well, um, I started from a very early age to be interested in space flight. If I look at the books I was reading when I was a child in primary school, they already talk about space. So, of course, since I was born in a, let's say, in the countryside, in a place where there are more pigs than inhabitants, <laughs> I'm afraid, um, that was not something that people took seriously. Those around me said, well, come on, you keep dreaming. But... And so I gave it up almost until I reached high school. And then at the end of high school, I asked it to myself, what do I want to do, really? And so I decided I wanted to do to study astronomy. And uh, I was, it was a bit of a jump in the, in the dark for me at the time, because I got no support <laughs> from, from anybody. Everybody thought I was weird, strange, because of a very provincial, let's say, uh, environment where I was coming from. But then everything went well, because uh, the big change was the fact that someone really uh, trusted, uh, trusted my potential. And so since I started working on my master thesis, my supervisor really gave me the opportunities that allowed me to become what I am, what I am today. So it was this critical passage to have someone uh, really uh, supporting you once you finish your your studies and you start your, uh, let's say, the, the first steps in your career as a scientist that changes things, at least for me. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Roberto. Akosh? Uh, it is strange that my story has some common aspects with Roberto. Actually, my very first memory that I, I have some interest in astronomy is from around the fourth year of primary school when we had a we were writing a written examination, a test in the classroom. And uh, the girl next to me, in front of me, asked me, um, because he did, she did not know, asked me what objects are orbiting around planets. And I was so much surprised that there can be somebody who do not know this answer that first I did not answer, of course, after I answered her. And actually, so around the beginning of the primary school, I had an interest in astronomy, but also after second, the, roughly at the around the end of second uh, secondary school, uh, I was not so much sure what is it realistic to work in astronomy as a lifetime, as a job to to get enough money and so on and so forth. But after then I applied to the university, and <clears throat> when I started the university career. Actually, from there, it was a continuously slow growth and, and, and improvement regarding this aspect. And slowly, you, you got more familiar how the science works in reality, how you can get jobs in reality. So after that, it worked well. But what I, what I want to mention and emphasize for, for students is first, 
you do not give up your dreams. Please keep on working. But still, if you if you are accepted to, to study at the university, do not think that it will be enough only to have good grades and pass all the exams. Because at the same time, you need to start to build connections with the scientific domain beyond the even university. But it is possible. So if you need to always think about, okay, what will I do, let me say two years from now, and work on this to, to achieve that given small aim. Okay, thank you. Thank you for your, your advice and your views. Um, attendees, if you have questions, don't hesitate to ask them in the chat. We have, we have a few more minutes with our, our speakers. Um, if you, in the meantime, maybe I can ask a, a kind of short one, but also I think a complex one to answer. Um, in, the, in the visions for the future of the exploration of Mars, um, you mentioned several types of missions. Um, first, I, I would like to know uh, like the drones missions, the sample return missions, et cetera, what would be the time scale for those missions, if you have an idea? And uh, you also concluded with uh, human uh, missions to Mars. And so what, how far are we from those missions? Akosh, you can start, yes. yes. Uh, very good questions. <clears throat> I suppose the, um, these should be done by step by, uh, with step by step. But if you consider how long time does it take to make a mission to reality from IDs, you you need to you to need to assume roughly a decade. So you have an ID. After one after ten years, this ID make might uh, produce a landing on Mars. So this is the time scale of a given mission. But of course, there are several IDs and several ongoing projects. Actually, before we started the discussion in a few minutes with Roberto, we just discussed an international Mars mission, which was scheduled several years ago, but now a bit terminated because of financial reasons. Mm. So it is very difficult to, to say specifically when and which year do you expect something. But, but if, you, if you would like to do logical, logical steps, then the next step should be uh, a larger access on the surface of Mars, so drone-based uh, survey, drilling to the subsurface and sample return. So these should, should happen. So we cannot avoid, let me say, these steps. But after this, when human will land on Mars, it's very difficult to, to answer because uh, in the last, let me say, half century, everybody every time says, okay, from now, 30 years. But we, we already said this more than 30 years ago and we are still not there. So it's a, it's a difficult question, but I think these yeah. these uh, these are so logical steps that should or must be taken. Actually, when specifically when it's a difficult question, but in the in the decade time scale, we should think about. Okay, thanks. Yes, interesting. It's true that on the on the side of the general public, we only see uh, the missions when they are actually launching, or maybe just a bit before when they are like ready to launch. Uh, but yeah, as you're saying, there are a lot of missions that are actually born as ideas and then just don't have the time or financial support to continue. Roberto, do you want to add something? Oh, you're on mute, sorry. <laughs> sorry, no, not much really. It's just that um, the, the now mass exploration is such a wide scope um, endeavor that in general what is really uh, what is making success possible is cooperation and uh, when we are talking about missions that cost billions and billions of dollars and euros of course there's no it's not easy for a single country no matter how big to do it all alone and uh, in fact mars exploration in principle could constitute a framework for international cooperation. And there is cooperation ongoing, uh, certainly between NASA and the European Space Agency. Um, it would be certainly hopeful um, and hoped 
sorry, that um, this cooperation could somehow be envisioned, enlarged, and, and more inclusive. But uh, unfortunately, what really is uh, one of the factors contributing to the delays and cancellations that uh, Akosh was mentioning is also the, the current political climate. There's no denying, because before, just a few years back, uh, there were ample uh, programs to involve uh, Russia and even China in the exploration of Mars, and now everybody's going on its own. China, of course, has demonstrated the capability to land on Mars by itself, uh, by, and, and, and so they have this, they certainly are not uh, second to, to anybody in, in this respect. But uh, the deterioration of the international relationships now makes the possibility of a joint international exploration of Mars, like sometimes you see in science fiction movies where you have very international crews, which is a European and American and Chinese and, uh, and a Russian and so forth, okay. uh, non-existent essentially. <laughs> and that's, that's, that's a real pity. Okay. Yeah, thanks for uh, bringing in this broader view of, uh, of the current situation. And yeah, we can only hope that uh, it will get uh, better and uh, with closer, closer things and bonds in the future. Um, I don't see any more questions in the chat. Um, I hope we got everything answered. If not, uh, you're always welcome to send uh, an email to Lectures Without Borders and we will be happy to share it with our speakers. Um, I think we are, uh, we are done now. So thank you again, Roberto, and thank you, Akosh, for thank your you. time. Uh, it was certainly very interesting to have you. Attendees, uh, just a reminder that the recordings of this webinar will be available on our YouTube channel. So don't hesitate to share it, show it to students. And this will be, uh, I'm sure, a very good material to think about the exploration of Mars for your students. So thank you, everyone. And I thank wish you a great day. Thank, thank you very you. much. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Bye.